You are watching DHTV from California State University to Vegas Hills. Now, we're going to get into and understand, appreciate something about disease. Um, when we take a look at the passage across, as Europeans are going to be crossing towards the Western Hemisphere, we need to appreciate the boats that they're coming in, and the conditions on those boats, and the types of men that are coming. Because women will not arrive in significant numbers until 150 years later, Columbus's arrival. So it's going to be primarily men coming across in these boats, <clears throat> and these boats in the, in, in the age of discovery, what they call the age of discovery, these boats that are going to be moving to the Western Hemisphere. Um, they're not very big. Uh, in fact, they're the size of, of a normal classroom that holds 35 students, 40 students. That's how big the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria are. The massive boats that are going to hold maybe more than 100 people or 200 people are not going to be built until 100 years later, once the Dutch become more um, uh, gifted in their uh, technology of be being able to build uh, larger ships. But the ships that are coming across um, in the 1500s hold maximum about 40, 40 to 50 men crammed. They're crammed in this boat. And the conditions on the boat are not very, very, uh, let's say, uh, clean. Uh, clean. Uh, they're not cleanly. They're not, uh, there's no sanitation. And uh, there's tremendous filth and disease on these boats. And then the men, the men that are coming across. One of the most important things was recruiting labor forces to come to the Western Hemisphere, especially since it was greed and avarice that's guiding Europe. Uh, everybody wants to uh, uh, lay claim to the Western Hemisphere. So it's Christ and money that that's, that's what they're coming for. And so what's going to happen is we need to appreciate what what happens when Columbus does arrive and what happens when the when the Portuguese do arrive in Brazil and then the British and the French arrive and what the conditions on the boats were with regards to these men that were coming across. Now you can imagine women cramming men and 40 men into a boat and they don't know where they're going and the kinds of men that are going to be recruited are not going to be um, um, uh, very, um, let's, let's say, honorable men. Um, there's, a, there's a misspelled word, if you can take it off and put, put it back, there's the impact of uh, diese, but it should be disease, but nonetheless it looks like diarrhea, and that's probably what happened, was the impact of diarrhea on this particular experience. But yeah, if you can uh, 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 change that word. But... Um, Columbus, uh, you all are going to be reading in, in uh, a, a, a chapter from uh, Howard Zinn's Columbus's arrival. Um, was he a hero or was he a murderer of the Arawak? Um, there will be, you'll be reading passages from a, a journal uh, that was written by a priest, for, uh, Bartolomeo de las Casas, who becomes the first defender of Indian rights in the Western Hemisphere. Um, when, when we take a look at the Spanish, when they arrive, they're going to use the Caribbean as headquarters for the invasion of what Amerigo Vespucci is going to be given credit for over Columbus. Um, Columbus thought he reached India. So why, why isn't it that we are called, we should be called Colombians, North Colombians, Central Colombians, South Colombians? Why are we called Americans? It's because... Amerigo Vespucci, who traveled southward and realized a different continent because he was able to go uh, and realize South America, that, that there was another continent that existed, and it was, that the islands that, that Columbus reached was not India. He goes back to the Pope, and his, his maps are going to be used by British explorers, and so the British, when they arrive, they're going to be calling it America after Amerigo Vespucci rather than Christopher Columbus's maps. So this is one of the reasons why, uh, why we, we use the term America. But let me get back to the discussion of the diseases. Uh, one of the things about the men that are going to be coming across is that they're coming from 
prisons because they could not find labor forces that were willing to just give up their lives. And remember, migration, that's a decision that people make to move. And you cannot just ask people all of a sudden to lift up their lives and move west unless they're merchants and, 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 and they require uh, a, you know, a, a contract uh, that's going to be more expensive than just regular labor force. So you go to the prisons. So you bring in people who are going to get a uh, get-out-of-jail card free, and so you can uh, get rid of people from your prison population. And that's exactly what Europe is going to do, is send, send prisoners on these boats. And so you can imagine these men not knowing where they're going for about, <clears throat> and then they're already on, the, on a ship, uh, and it's already third week, fourth week, uh, they're, they're getting anxious. They're getting anxious because they don't know where they're headed. And in this anxiety, uh, they become uh, mutinous. In other words, they're going to try to overthrow the ones that are financing this particular expedition. So you have a technical crew, you have the crew that's being paid, uh, and then you have uh, all the labor forces that are uh, necessary for this uh, exploration. And so um, you can recognize that also there's, there's a problem with regards to water, um, availability of, of water. Uh, and and w what will happen is that scurvy, uh, a disease sets in because they don't have vitamin C. And um, you, your body can only go without water for four days. After that, um, you get canker sores, etc. And... and uh, there's this great um, um, Portuguese historian or uh, uh, Brazilian historian named Hilberto Freire who wrote a great book in the 1960s called Masters and Slaves. And he shared the history of the Portuguese encounter with the Amazonian peoples. And he described what was happening on those boats. And, and it was just amazing the ways that he just shared how the disease was in the men themselves, and they committed mutiny. They murdered, and when they got to Brazil, when they got to Ilius in, in the mainland in Brazil, well, of course they're going to encounter the Brazilian peoples who live in the tropical zones, and in the tropical zones they're not wearing much clothing, and so these men went crazy, uh, and the native peoples they had a, a, a buffet of food out for. They're new visitors and they're very naive because they don't know anything about warfare. They're naked without shame. All they have is just their ritual regalia. And, you know, they're, they're uh, living in, in a tropical zone. They don't wear much clothing. So the, the men are uh, already filled with disease in their bodies, as Gilberto Freire is describing. Um, they're going to uh, use their sword. They're going to go... Uh, and, and, and just uh, take their swords out and chop the heads of the men and rape the women. And in the process, introduce the world to two new diseases known as gonorrhea and syphilis. And this was Gilberto Freire. Right? Gilberto Freire is very important to understand about the discussion of diseases and pathogens because it just began to spread. All right. Um, there is an, an, another anthropologist named Henry Dobbins. Henry Dobbins, um, in his writings, um, told the British that they must thank the Spanish since when the Puritans landed, uh, when the Puritans landed in 1620, well, Columbus arrived in 1492. And when Columbus arrived, there was two diseases that just devastated the populations, and that was... Um, when you take a look at the conditions of the, of the European boats, um, the men, the men uh, were ready to mutiny against Columbus. Um, and uh, they thought, let me just give you an example, they th uh, one, of, one of the, you know about miniature, miniature animals, right? There's miniature dachshund, there's miniature, all, all the different kinds of dogs. Well, there's a miniature, miniature whale, um, the manatee that uh, the dolphins just love in the warm waters off of the Caribbean. So the men who hadn't seen a woman in, what, four or five weeks, 
are going to imagine that that manatee is a mermaid, and they're going to go crazy. They're going to go try to jump in the water to go after them. And this was recorded in their in their experiences. So again, there's these these conditions, so you can imagine when the first encounter with native peoples and the native peoples in the Caribbean are not wearing much clothing. So these men are going to just go crazy. Um, they're going to be coming into a, literally a Garden of Eden where everybody is living naked without shame. And they will just go in and destroy. So you can imagine, uh, again, the passage across, the conditions on the boats, the type of men, the mutiny, and recognize the disease and the pathogens that are going to arrive with this first encounter. This first encounter is very important because um, on the established native trade routes out of the Caribbean onto the mainland, um, we're going to see the diseases enter. All right? uh, prior to the arrival of the, great, of, of, of the British, prior to the arrival of the French, the Spanish will have already sent diseases northward, eastward, and westward from the Caribbean. So this one anthropologist named Henry Dobbins um, insists that the British have to thank the Spanish because when the British do arrive uh, in, in um, um, Massachusetts Bay, when they, the pilgrims arrive, um, they're going to encounter one-tenth of the warrior population. They would never have been able to establish permanent communities if it hadn't been for the Spanish arrival in 1492. So when you, when you take a look at 1492 to 1621, in that 128-year period between 1492 and the arrival of the pilgrims, pathogens traveled up the Atlantic coast. It was a 128-year history of native adjustments to the diseases that are going to be introduced. So, when we take a look at what's happening on the mainland, we need to recognize that there is a huge discussion in the archaeological record about the decline of the different cultures that I had pre presented to you in the previous presentations, okay? Now, there's the Mississippian cultures. There's the, the, the Southwestern cultures. Now, they, before the Spanish arrive, are already going to be in decline prior to the arrival of Spanish conquistadores into the region. Um, the Mississippian cultures, there's going to be a decline in the Mississippian cultures. There's only going to be one particular man that's going to be able to uh, 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 encounter um, Itoa and Cahokia, the city-states that disappeared uh, until the arrival of Lewis and Clark, they'll notice that they were sitting on Cahokia as they were mapping out their strategy to go uh, into the Mississippi uh, region. Um, when when uh, Thomas Jefferson purchased Louisiana territory from the French. So there's a decline of Mississippian cultures. Um, the reasons for those decline, uh, archaeologists put there was military struggles and loss of food supplies. Um, but most, most importantly, disease, some, some disease historians suggest that it influenced people to change from a fixity of community residence to decentralized subsistence communities, from male-centered to female-centered societies. So this meant desertion and new migration patterns. So when we take a look at the Mississippian cultures in the southeast from the coastal gulf into the plains, the only Europeans that are going to enter this region in the plains are brief visits of conquistadores in the 1500s. Um, we'll have to wait for Spanish colonization programs to establish themselves in the 17th century where significant contact occurs. Uh, the British are going to arrive along the Atlantic coast and the French are going to move down the Ohio and the Mississippi from Canada. Um, and, and, and this is going to cause changes uh, in, in, the, in the area. Um, with the Northeast and the Great Lakes region, there is the Iroquois Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse. They have a story of prior to the arrival of Europeans where they're going to encounter uh, difficulty, uh, relations between men and women and relations between uh, the humans and the animal world are going to come into um, uh, um, conflict and there's going to be great, great calamities 
and the native peoples have to come together because they're going to go into war with each other. And in their history, they talk about a history of, of struggle. And this, is, this perhaps can be related to the fact that disease has entered their society. Um, so that's the Northeast and the Great Lakes region. Um, there's the oral story of, um, in, in the Haudenosaunee of, of, the, of Deganawada and the rise of the Haudenosaunee that they have to come together to build peace amongst themselves. And this was all prior to the arrival of the, the French and the British. Um, in the Southwest, when we take a look at the decline of Southwest cultures that are shared with you, the, the Hohokam, the Anasazi, and the Mogoyan, uh, the decline has already been set in motion. Um, the, there's a historical sequence that's very hazy. Um, people don't really know uh, with regards to the decline. It could happen in 1250 or 1400 or 1650. The archaeological evidence reveals that the peoples from the southwest uh, are, are going to disappear um, uh, because of military struggles and the loss of, again, food supplies. Um, there's environmental disruption, um, agricultural failures, political mismanagement, the decline of regional trade, uh, drought, floods, the oral traditions of the native peoples, especially the Hopi, they say that the Anasazi committed ecological errors, while the Oatam say that the Hohokam went against their religious prescriptions and ignored the ecologically sensitive subsistence techniques that they were taught. So there's all of these changes that are occurring in the southeast, in the central gulf. Um, we're going to be seeing um, uh, when the Spanish Jew arrived, they're going to introduce a horse. The horse is going to create a new culture along the plains. Um, in the Chippewa oral tradition, or the Ojibwa oral tradition, um, they are peoples that are going to be moving westward from the Great Lakes simply because of the decline that's occurring in the Mississippian cultures, they're going to move over into the uh, <clears throat> more north along the Mississippi into Wisconsin and over to uh, Minnesota. So <clears throat> there's uh, great discussions with regards to the changes and the impact of disease on these societies. So I just want to share with you that uh, one of the things that's most important to appreciate about uh, the occurrences uh, uh, that Columbus but why Columbus is so important is that Columbus does uh, uh, bring about significant change prior to the arrival of other Europeans. So the Spanish uh, began an initiation or, or initiate the impact of disease on the Western Hemisphere. Okay, so that's that will end. Uh, I, I just want to do that particular segment so that we can appreciate something about the impact of disease. Um, the disease factor is very important. Uh, it leads to a decline of native populations. They leave the state centralized societies. They move uh, from the fi fixity of communities to subsistence economies. So they're moving back to their traditions, uh, their archaic traditions. They're relying on their archaic traditions and their classic or post-classic experiences is in decline. Um, disease was one factor, especially along up and down the coast. Okay, so let's understand that. <clears throat>